classroom is always getting, not the classroom, but the uh, attendance always dwindles away because uh, these later weeks, that's okay. Um, Bless you. interested in more statistics, I, I, these classes aren't really offered through extension, but you might be able to find other classes on your own. Uh, a good class after this class um, might be an experimental design class, a NOVA slash design of experiments. But I guess it depends on the type of uh, work that you are doing. Um, but ANOVA yeah, frequently goes hand in hand with uh, design of experiments. The general premise in design of experiments is that you want the groups, your treatment groups, to be as similar as possible with the exception of the treatment variable. Okay? So uh, the, the guiding principle is groups should be as similar as possible <clears throat> with the exception of the treatment variable. do your analysis and you detect a difference between the groups, you can attribute that difference due to the fact that the treatment variables were different and not to other, um, other spurious things that could, could mislead you. So, uh, so any actual difference, so any, oh, I'm sorry, any difference detected uh, at the end of the experiment can be attributed For example, in your lab report with uh, St. John's Wort and the ADHD and all this thing, they had this whole selection process. And basically, they were trying to just make sure that the groups were as similar as possible. Okay? Where? Except for the fact that one group they gave the placebo and one group they gave the St. John's Wort. So that any difference that they detect, um, if, if any, uh, can be attributed to that, not because you know that all the one, you know, all the kids in that had certain issues or something ended up in one group or another. All right. So this brings up the idea of blocking. Okay. So usually you have one variable that you're interested in. Okay. And in one way, Nova, that would be. 
your between groups variable. So if you have one variable of interest, but there might also be another variable that we can call a nuisance variable. So and uh, and you just can't get rid of the nuisance variable. So what we have to do is that when we set up our experiment, we want to set up our experiment in such a way, that we can account for and analyze the, analyze out the nuisance variable. So let's say you have a, you want to um, test to see if uh, uh, different fertilizers uh, cause, uh, maybe you have a bunch of tomato plants see which one helped produce the biggest tomatoes. All right. So you have maybe three different fertilizers. Or maybe two, two fertilizers and, and a control. Okay? So and so we have we have three groups. And you want to know which fertilizer okay, do the fertilizers even make a difference? And uh, uh, and if they do, you know, are any of them different? Okay, so right, you've got the uh, yeah the control, and then you've got cheap fertilizer and expensive fertilizer. You want to just know is there a difference between these products? But unfortunately, um, let's say the place where you're going to grow your um, tomato plants, let's say uh, you built the greenhouse, but then whoever whoever built the greenhouse. Let's say uh, it's next to a building, and so um, some parts of the greenhouse get lots of light, other parts um, don't get as much. There's like a shadow cast over it or something, and space is limited, so you're gonna have to put plants everywhere. Okay, you can't you can't just put all the plants in one section. All right, so let's say you had. Um, Six plants, a total of 18 plants. Okay. So let's say this, this part of the building gets uh, lots of sun. Uh, this is medium sun and no sun. Or not no sun, but little sun. So let's say you have 18 plants. And so you're going to do um, six control, six uh, fertilizer A, and six fertilizer B. <coughs> when you set up your experiment, what you do not want to do, you do not want to put all six fertilizer B here, and all six fertilizer A here, and all six control here. Because what's going to happen is that may, at the end of the experiment, maybe you notice, oh, you know what? All the control plants hardly grew. And the uh, fertilizer B plants grew a ton, and fertilizer A didn't grow very much. I mean, it grew some, but but not as much as fertilizer B. Well, actually, you don't know if the difference in the growth is because of the fertilizers or because of the sun. Okay? Because the way you set up your, your plants, um, the amount of sun is confounded with the treatment variable. Okay? So this really would cause a confounding. 
situation. Okay, so that would be a bad, a bad situation. Much better would be if you could put two of fertilizer A, two of fertilizer B, and two control in this section, two A, two B, and two control in this section, and two A, two B, and to control in that section, okay? And then, if consistently, in all three sections, if the plants under fertilizer B grew the most, okay, so the two plants in, fertilize, uh, in this section of fertilizer B grew the most, and the two plants here grew the most, and the two plants under fertilizer B also grew the most, then you can conclusively say, oh yeah, fertilizer B is the most effective. Or, or whatever. Whatever happens, at least now you can, you can um, pull out the, um, the effect of the sun. Okay? Because you can, maybe, maybe all of the plants here in general grew taller than the plants over here. Right? So then you have an idea of how much of the difference is due to the sun versus whereas before you had no idea. Okay. So this would be a better design. Okay. And we call this um, a randomized block design. Because okay. when you say I'm going to put two of fertilizer A in here, you randomly select um, which two plants go in which, uh, which of the plants go in there. Okay, so you randomly assign them, but you make sure that you get 2A, 2B, and 2C in there. Okay, so that would be, um, this, is, this would be the randomized block design. And most, uh, I think, no, Across the board, statisticians would agree that a randomized block design is better than just a pure random design. Okay, pure random means you're just going to put plants in here at random. Okay, uh, you're going to use a computer to assign them or some random method. Maybe you just put A, B, and C into a hat and you draw them out. But you could end up getting something like uh, 3A and 3B, you know, 4C, uh, 1A, uh, 1B, and that leaves uh, 2C, 2A, and 2B here. Okay, you could get something like this, all right, with a completely random design. D you know, of course, everything's going to be different, but this would be. Complete random. And then here again, um, you just you can't uh, account for the effect due to the sun. Okay, because you don't know how much, so maybe these plants grow more or less or something. You're not sure if it was how much of an effect the sun played. Whereas when you have the block design, uh, you get a better idea of, of the effects due to the sun. Okay. So with the uh, randomized block design, um, the individual values, okay, so each value is um, the grand mean, the population grand mean, plus the uh, 
treatment effect, treatment or group effect. plus a block effect okay. plus this is just known as um, the individual variation this is the residual table, your source, your df, and your sum of squares would have, um, you would have treatment. This is the, basically, um, between the groups, the treatment, the block, the um, within or residual. So one way ANOVA, you did not have this block thing going on in there. And uh, with a block design, you now have a second variable. Okay. So that's it. Yes? So in the lab uh, study with the St. John's work, they did the, they did the randomized block design, right? I don't remember. What, did, what were they blocked it on? I think yeah. just the the differences between the control and the treatment. Yeah, I don't I don't think they um I'll have to reread the study. Uh, I I haven't I didn't read it this morning. I think they yeah. might have done it between yeah. like the genders or demographics or whatever. Um maybe. I'm not sure. Okay, I'm not sure. If if they said they made sure that um both groups had the same number of males and the same number of females, or they made sure both groups had this and that. It might be a block design, but if they just kind of <coughs> left it to randomness to kind of check, I'll, I'll have to I'll have to read it to, to get back to you. I'm not really, I can't conclusively answer that. Okay, but this is a common design. Um, so in that circumstance, we consider the effect of sun to be a nuisance variable. Okay. Other times, somebody else might say, oh, you know what, that's not a nuisance variable. We actually want to know the effect due to the sun. Or, um, or you know, you might have two variables, and you think there's some kind of thing going on, okay? So then you might have two-way ANOVA. Two-way, um, and it also might be called factorial. Uh, ANOVA. And so here you have, you, you're gonna have two treatment effects. Two treatment effects two treatment variables or effects, uh, and an interaction.
second treatment, so the second variable, and then you add in an interaction plus just the individual difference variation. Okay. That's a gamma. It looks like a y. It's gamma. Third letter of the Greek alphabet. So it's similar to uh, the block design, but there's but what the difference here is it includes something called an interaction. Okay. So if there were no interaction, okay. So the averages. Let's say. Um, So they did some experiment, okay? And basically, uh, our two variables, we did um, shaking and light, right? So apparently, we're growing soybeans, okay? This is the effect on soybean growth. This is our response. So we want to see how much soybeans grow, okay? And so um, our two variables are shaking. So we either had um, control or we shook the plants. And light, we had either low light or uh, lots of light. Now we call it low light or moderate. So, um, so you would have a total of four, four treatments. You have control, meaning no shaking under low light, control under moderate light, uh, shaking under uh, low light, and shaking under moderate light. And this is the uh, these are the uh, the numbers that they got. I'm just gonna make up numbers, okay? What page are you on? Page four fifty. So let's say uh, um, okay, I'm just gonna take these numbers. So we have control low light two forty five, control under moderate light. Rounding to 305, stress low light, shaking low light, 213, and this is 269. Okay, it doesn't quite matter. What we see is that the effect of Control low light to control moderate. Okay, so the the change due to the light here was uh, sixty points, and then over here it was uh, what is it? Fifty six. Okay, that's the effect of changing from low light to moderate light. 
um, if I go from, if I compare the control versus shaking, okay, for the low light, we see over here, this went down 32. And if I look at the control moderate versus shaking moderate, so this is leaving the lights in the same, we're giving both of these the amount of light, we see this went down um, 36 points. Something like that. Right? So overall, what it seems to be is that going from low light to moderate light adds about 50, 55, 60 points, something in that range, vicinity, and then changing, going from regular to shaking the plants seems to decrease height by about 30 to 36 points, something in the same vicinity, okay? So over here we would say not much of an interaction effect, okay? Because for those under low light, okay, <coughs> switching, okay, uh, okay, okay. So the, the plants that we did, didn't shake, changing the amount of light from low to high caused the, um, caused the, uh, the ones under moderate light to grow more by about 60 units, whatever the units these are, okay? When we looked at the shaking plants, the amount they grew when we switched from low to high, also up in the same vicinity, 56 points, okay? When we looked at the plants under low light condition, going from still to shaking caused the shaken plants to grow less by about 32 units. When we looked at the ones under moderate light, going from still to shaking caused these plants to grow less by about 36 units, okay? They're in the same same vicinity. Okay. On the other hand, let's say we did a different plant, and all of these things kind of grew um, uh, these numbers ended up being the same, but let's say uh, this drops down to 200. Okay. If this were to happen, what we would see is that this dropped down 13 points, and this drops down 105 points. Here, we would say something crazy is happening, okay? Because when I went from low light to moderate light for the control group, it grew 60 points, okay? I would have expected something similar to happen, but when I went from low light to moderate light under shaking conditions, Instead of going up 60 points, it went down 13 points. That's strange, okay? And then when I left the lights on low, and I didn't, and I went from control to shaking, it dropped down 32 points. But when I had the lights on high, and I brought in the shaking, it dropped down 105 points, okay? So this is telling me that something is happening between the amount of light and the amount of shaking that happens. And for some reason, this combination of shaking, shaking under moderate light is having a really strange effect on the, on the plants, okay? And in that circumstance, uh, we would say there's some, some kind of interaction effect. Strong interaction effect. Okay. 
and that would make an appearance when you do the ANOVA. We're not going to bother with the nitty gritty of doing the actual ANOVA analysis, but I just want you to let you know that those um, there's more to ANOVA than one-way ANOVA. Again, one-way ANOVA is the most simple form of ANOVA that we can do. So there's, there's uh, other methods, more complicated, uh, which might come in handy. So I had trouble finding a good article. If you find a good article with ANOVA, one-way ANOVA, uh, let me know. But uh, OK, so this, these uh, researchers, they want to know what, um, what demographic or smoking habit traits, OK? What things ha might have an effect or might be related to when somebody uh, started smoking, okay? So we ask people, um, you know, do you smoke? If they said yes, or have you ever smoked? And they said yes, we would say, when did you start smoking? And then they'd say, oh, I started smoking when I was 15, or I started smoking when I was 20. I started smoking at this, this age, okay? So you can read through all of this, Basically, they're just saying how they picked people, and then they did one way ANOVA. Okay, so here's here's the uh, the table that we're looking at. Can you guys read this? It's mm -hmm. way too small. <coughs> okay, so they said uh, they asked 1,400 people, 1,447. 807 were men, 640 were women, and they, you know, they, they asked the men, when did you start smoking? The average age, 16.8 years. They asked the women, when did you start smoking? The average age, 18.3. Is there a significant, is that difference between 16.8 and 18.3 significant? The answer, yes, okay, because they did a p-value. So you could do this with a t-test, and they got a p-value of less than 0.001. They actually include the standard deviation for you. So it's hard to find good research papers where they include all of this stuff. Um, OK, so this, they could have done a t-test. They might have done ANOVA. But when you have two groups, you can do a t-test, no problem. Maybe um, if they asked, uh, they, they asked ethnicity, OK? Apparently, they only found uh, non-Hispanic, white, Hispanic, African American. So uh, they said, OK, when did you start smoking? And the average age here was 17.3. The average age was 17.5. And the average age here was 18.4. Okay? They, they, they did one-way ANOVA to see if 
the average age for the three groups are the same, or if at least one of the groups is different. When they did that, the p-value was 0.001. Okay. And so basically, every time you see a p-value here, that means they did one way and over. So they did one way and over for uh, educational attainment. You know, how much education do you have? And then, so we, you know, we see that those who uh, graduated college started on average at 17.8 years, whereas those who didn't complete high school at an average start smoking at 16.8 years. Okay. And then they did a test and they get this p value. Okay. And then they did that. Um, so those were demographic um, related traits. Okay. And then these are um, I guess what they call habit uh, or I don't know what they call these things. You know, based on how much how much they smoke, or um, how many years they smoked, see if there was a, a connection. Okay, those who um, you know smoke more than a pack a day uh, have an average start uh, start age that's lower than those who smoke less than a pack a day. Things like that. Okay, so um, so your homework the lab, and it, and it should be simple, is just to take one of those categories and just do an ANOVA analysis by hand. So here I, here I did it for um, the race-related uh, race uh, demographics, and I said, you know, this is this, and then I found the, uh, the grand mean, and then I did the between group, within group, and figured out an F statistic. And that's all I want you guys to do. Should not be too bad. Okay. All right. All right. So, and then with this last amount of time, I want to uh, get into um, some stuff about alpha. Significance level and, and all that stuff. So this applies to all hypothesis tests. Okay, it applies to all hypothesis tests. So not just ANOVA, but also t tests, chi-squared tests, things like that. Okay, our choice of alpha determines when we reject or don't reject the null hypothesis. Whenever our p-value is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. P value less than alpha means oh, reject the null. P value greater than alpha, don't reject the null. And the probability of a type 1 error is equal to alpha. Because there's always the question, or because our p-value answers the question, what is the probability that I observe this data if the null hypothesis were true. Okay. And so there's always going to be an alpha probability that you observe this data under the null hypothesis. Okay, so if, I'm sorry. If, uh, if your p-value is 4%, there's a 4% chance 
that you can observe this data under the null hypothesis. Okay? And we're saying, well, that 4% seems pretty small, so I'm going to reject the null hypothesis. Okay? But could, it, could the null hypothesis be true? Yes, it could be true. And the data you observed could have happened with a 4% probability. Okay? So the probability of a type 1 error is equal to your choice of alpha. If you choose alpha 5%, then you have to accept the fact that about 5% of the time, just because of random chance, you're going to get data that causes you to reject the null hypothesis even when the null hypothesis is true. Okay? So if alpha equals 5%, uh, you must accept So your choice of alpha reflects how willing you are to make a type 1 error. Type 1 error, if we need to review, is uh, rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. Okay. The null hypothesis is true. You don't want to reject it, but if you committed a type 1 error, that means you rejected it. And it's not your fault, it's just that because of the random nature of data, by random chance, you happen to get a set of data that led you astray. Yes? Is that the equivalent of a 95% confidence interval? Yeah. The, our 95%, uh, that 95% comes from 1 minus alpha. Yeah. Okay, yeah, because we said, could the null, I mean, could the mean actually be outside of the 95% confidence interval? Sure, it can be. It just means the data you observed happened to be weird enough that it led you to this confidence interval that didn't get the true true value of the mean. Yeah, same idea. So how you uh, work this using using you know your analogy of uh, flyer and uh, an alarm? Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, let me. Uh, get to that in just a moment, okay? The flip side is a type 2 error. The type 2 error is the null hypothesis is false, but you did not reject it. of a type 2 error is called beta. Okay? The calculations for beta are kind of complicated and we're not going to get into it. Okay? I'm not, we won't get to uh, not complicated, complicated, but it's too much to explain. <laughs> so we'll just leave it as beyond the scope of the course. But the probability of a type 2 error is beta. The probability of type 1 error is alpha. Okay? If you need help remembering that, 1, the first letter 
of the Greek alphabet is alpha. The second letter of the alphabet is beta. Okay? This looks kind of like an A. This kind of looks like a B. Okay? And that's actually where we get alphabet because it's alpha beta. So, so the first part of the word alphabet is alpha. The second part of the word alphabet would be bets, but beta. Okay? <laughs> type 2. Alright, so probability of type 2 error is beta, and then 1 minus beta, so the complement of a type 2 error is known as power. Okay? So what would the complement of this be? Power. <laughs> okay, so the complement of this would be H0 is false, and you rejected it. Okay? So instead of, but you did not reject it, it is, you rejected it. Okay? So power would be um, H0 is false, and you rejected it. Okay? So that's a good thing. We want this probability to be high. The null hypothesis is false. We want to be able to reject it. Okay. So that's what I mean when we say a test is more powerful or less powerful. I said non-parametric tests in general are less powerful than their parametric counterparts because a param parametric test puts a bunch of assumptions. So if anything goes kind of out, um, goes astray breaking those assumptions, you can reject the null hypothesis. Under the, uh, with a non-parametric test, you're saying, I'm not going to make any assumptions. So what I have to, what I, what, for me to be convinced that I should reject the null hypothesis, what I observe needs to be really out there for me to say, um, I can reject the null. So in that case, it's less powerful because a lot of times, the null hypothesis might be false, but unless your data is really out there, you won't reject it. Okay. Um, the general rule is if you increase power, if you want to increase power, okay, so that's, in other words, reduce beta. So if you reduce beta, you increase alpha. Okay. So if you want to say, I'm going to reject the null hypothesis when it's false a lot more often. Okay. So if the null hypothesis is false, I want to be absolutely sure I reject it. You can accomplish this by having a large alpha. You say, okay, my threshold for rejection is very low. Anything seems astray, I'm going to reject the null. Okay? But the problem is that you're increasing alpha, which means you're increasing type 1 error. You might have a lot more false alarms. On the other hand, if you, want it, if you decrease alpha, you're probably going to reduce power. You're going to increase beta. Right? Decrease alpha will cause uh, lower, less power, uh, which means more data or more type two error. I shouldn't say more beta, larger data. Okay. So let's take a look at. Um, carbon monoxide detector. Okay. Carbon monoxide is an odorless gas, invisible, and it can kill you. Right. So they sell carbon monoxide detectors. And the idea is it's supposed to alert you if you have dangerous levels of carbon monoxide. So its main job 
is to alert you when there's dangerous levels of carbon monoxide. And then the other job, which is so obvious that you don't think about it until it's not doing this job, is that it's supposed to stay quiet when you have regular amounts of carbon monoxide. Okay? So it has two jobs. It's got to make an alarm when, when there's lots of carbon monoxide, and it needs to be silent when there's no carbon monoxide. Either of these don't happen, we have an error. Okay? So the carbon monoxide detector uses the error, uses carbon, it tries to detect, it, I guess it looks at the error, and then it decides whether or not to sound an alarm. Okay? So the null hypothesis would be what? Is the null hypothesis that it's safe, or is the null hypothesis that it's dangerous? It's safe. It's safe, okay? Because we always use evidence to reject the null, okay? So in this case, it'd be null hypothesis safe, the alternative not safe. All right? This is proper function, right? Proper function. Alarm when there's carbon monoxide, silence when safe. Okay, improper function. Okay, or malfunction. Is what? Okay, there's two things that could happen. One is it could be silent when there's carbon monoxide. So alarm when it's safe. Okay. So if the null hypothesis is safe and the alternative is not safe, silence when there's carbon monoxide would be a type 1 or a type 2 error. Type 2, right? Type 2 is the null hypothesis is false, meaning it's not safe but we did not reject it, meaning we stayed silent. So this is a type 2 error. And then alarm when it's safe would be a type 1 error. Okay. The um, null hypothesis is true, but you rejected it. It is actually safe, but we rejected it, so we sound the alarm. Okay? All right. Between these two, which error is worse? Type 2 error, right? I think we will universally agree that we would rather have an alarm and be annoyed by it than not hear the alarm and die. Okay? So this is far worse, right? I mean, we don't want this, okay? But this is a worse error. Okay. So in that case, should we pick a large alpha or a small alpha? Large. Large alpha, right? Large alpha. So this, because this is worse, and if we had to choose between making the, the errors, we would rather make this one, we pick a large alpha. By a carbon monoxide detector, it's made to be very sensitive, okay, and that, um, uh, and in fact, if you read the instructions, a lot of them will say um, 
if an alarm goes off, okay, don't immediately evacuate the house, but reset it, okay, and wait half an hour. And if it goes off again, then go, all right? But there's also a chance that it was a false alarm. So after you reset it, if it doesn't go off again in the next half hour or hour, then you might be safe, okay? But if it goes off again, then you probably have dangerous levels of carbon monoxide, okay? Because they make them very sensitive so that it will go off. And it could go off just because, I don't know, the furnace kicked on or something, okay? That would be, um, so that's the carbon monoxide. Okay? So that's a case where a type two error is worse than a type one error, so we pick a large element. Right. On the other hand, can you think of any situation where a type 1 error is worse than a type 2 error? Okay. Well, actually, I'll, I'll just tell you my example. Okay. So the way our, um, our justice system is set up in the United States is we have decided that a type 1 error is worse than a type 2 error. We, we don't say it this way. Okay. But there's a, somewhere along the line, along the way in the, the founding of our country, I don't know who said this, okay? But they said, I'd rather let a hundred guilty people go free than in prison an innocent person, okay? And I, you know, whether or not you agree with that statement, okay? Uh, that's kind of the guiding principle in our court system. We would rather let guilty people free than imprison innocent people, all right? And, and so our justice system, uh, let's set it this way, okay? So we always say the defendant is innocent until proven guilty. So that means our null hypothesis would be the defendant is innocent, right? Okay? And the alternative is the defendant is guilty. We don't um, uh, the burden of proof falls on the prosecution. They need to produ produce enough evidence to convince you that the defendant is guilty. Okay, so. Proper, if the uh, justice system works, um, the proper thing would be uh, we convict when guilty, and we acquit when innocent. Okay, that's the proper thing. Is that how you spell acquit? I don't know. Okay, and then we'll say the justice system fails when um, when these things happen. Okay, we, uh, if we um, acquit when guilty, or if we convict. justice system has failed. Okay. So acquitting when someone is guilty, is that a type 1 or type 2 error? Type 2. Type 2. And then this would be a type 1. Okay. And, um, and that notion, that we rather let 100 innocent, I mean 100 guilty people go free and to convict, convict uh, an innocent person, that means we do we really want to avoid type one error. Okay, so in this case, we say type one error is worse. Right. Every now and then. Type two error is worse. Uh, these are these are everyone's entitled to their opinions, but the way our justice system is set up, it's 
set up in a way that the type one error is worse. And I, and I would agree <laughs> that we don't want it. We don't want to convict any innocent people, okay? Just, you know, especially in like capital punishment situations. Um, but, you know, that's like your uh, that's like the worst nightmare. Worst worst case scenario is you know executing an innocent person. You know, and, you know we live in America, so you know that's. That's good, right? Other other people who in other parts of the world they don't have that um, the same rights that we do. Okay, so anyway, because we said a type one error is worse, do we pick a large alpha or a small alpha? Small alpha. We pick small alpha. Okay. And they say this. They tell you, don't they? They don't say choose a small alpha. Okay. But if you're on the in, on a jury, the uh, the judge will charge the jury and say, you know, make sure. What does this say? Make sure you, you are uh, convinced beyond a reasonable doubt. Beyond a reasonable doubt. So that means uh, you don't want to just say you don't want to convict someone if you just have a hunch that they're guilty. You need to be near absolutely certain. That this person is guilty, not not on a hunch, but beyond a reasonable doubt. So they say, uh, choose a small alpha. Okay, so um, uh, somewhere, you know, for better or worse, uh, we've chosen alpha equal to 0 0.05, uh, almost universally. But that may or may not be the best solution, right? Depending on your situation, you may want a large alpha or a small alpha. These are extreme examples where um, you know maybe one error is clearly far worse than another. Okay, but uh, depending on um, on what you are, like if you are a pharmaceutical company and you're trying to uh, develop drugs, okay. In the beginning, you might want to choose a large alpha. Okay, you want to just be able to see. Um, well, you know, different pharmaceutical companies they do different approaches, but sometimes they just say, "Here, let's let's just try a bunch of drugs and see if anything happens." Right? Okay, and then so in the beginning, you might want to choose a large alpha, just in case one of the drugs happens to do something. You just want to be able to detect that right away. Okay. On the other hand. When you're, so let's say something pops up and you go, oh, maybe this thing will work, okay? Before you release it to the public, you probably want to choose a smaller alpha to make sure that it actually does what it's supposed to do, okay? So depending on your situation, you know, 0.05 may or may not be the, uh, the best answer, okay? All right, that's, uh, that's all I have for you guys today. We'll, uh, we'll finish a tiny bit early. So in reality, um, a lot of drugs are really